So first thing I would do when I start a project is just put a fill, a black fill layer over it and just uh, no glossiness or spec info, just black. It's kind of the same principle as putting a base coat when you're painting miniatures. It's so that if any of my color ID map um, have some uh, like some little places like especially like in uh, crevices where uh, the mask is not applied at least there's something underneath and black is usually uh, a pretty decent base coat in that case so that's what I usually put and then um, beforehand before I started texturing I tried out I tried out some uh, color scheme um, as you can see, none of them are exactly the one I ended up choosing, but I did really like the one with the reds and uh, the gold uh, hues. So once I'm done, usually I'll just block out the colors on the model itself to see what it looks like. Um, so I'll just quickly show some of the, uh, the folders. I try, as you can see, I try to keep everything mostly neat. Um, maybe there's a, a bit too many folders, but eh. So for example, let's look at the coat. So I'm not a huge fan of just um, taking a, uh, a material or a smart material and just slapping out in there. Uh, depending on the material, I might just start from scratch and just put the color, play with the, uh, the initial values that I want for glossiness or spec. Or sometimes, uh, in this case, I think that's what I did. I took, um, I believe it was one of the leather material, then just look in the folder and look at what each, uh, what each um, layer does, and then delete or modify um, the ones I wanted or did not want. So I, it's, it, I think it's a good way to, to learn a little bit more how to create materials on your own after that, or just to save time. So one thing I would suggest when you're working on your, um, your texture is to cycle between all of the different um, maps. So like uh, diffuse slash albedo, uh, specular roughness, whatever. Uh, you can do that by just um, pressing C and you can cycle between all of your different maps and I think that's something you should just keep doing uh, regularly when you're working on your project sometimes it, let's say you're just painting um, your spec well I like just having um, the actual spec layer and not have all of the other information um, just like conflicting with what I'm trying to do and then once you want uh, once you want to do uh, once you want to see the whole picture you can just press M and have uh, the actual material um, also something I forgot to mention one thing you should change right away when you start a new project is the environment map um, I'm not sure which one it gives by default but um, the Tomoko Studio One is probably one of the better one because all of the ones you see here, they have um, color in their light. It's not neutral, so what you see here might drastically change from what you're gonna end up with when you bring it in uh, Unreal or Marmoset. Actually, even with Tomoko, it's going to change, but at least um, the lighting is way more neutral. So Tomoko Studio for environmental map. Um, Actually, now that I brought it up, uh, once you actually start having enough information on your texture, like once you're past just blocking out the colors, it's a good idea to bring it in whatever engine you're going to render it in, because it might look great here, but then uh, once you bring it in Marmoset, let's say, and you you uh, start lighting it, it looks actually bad. So make sure to have your lighting set up um, ready pretty early on in your texturing process. 
Alright, let's break down one material just to show how I usually do it. So first thing first is I'll create a folder, name it, and then use the uh, color ID for masking. So in this example it would be the code. So I would pick the red. And then there's usually some work that you have to do on the mask because the ID map isn't always precise. So in this case I had to paint a bit. But otherwise, I'll usually add a very slight blur, followed by a sharpen, and that usually does the trick. After that, I'll put the base color along with the base specular glossiness or roughness metalness, depending on the workflow you're using. And this is where I start adding details. So there's a couple of ways you could do this. Sometimes it might just be better to pick one of the base material and then just look at the layers, see what you like, remove what you don't like. Because it, I think that's a good way to learn how to create your own materials. You, you don't always have to start from scratch or just use like what's given to you. There's nothing wrong with just combining stuff and learning from it. So in this case, I decided to add a little bit of grunge mainly to break some of the color because this is stylized i don't want too much info and i don't want the texture to get too muddy so i try to keep this somewhat subtle so i play with all of the uh, the blending modes and then that's something here that's very important to sell your art your stylized art it's cavities and edges so you'll notice that most of the time in uh, stylized art, all of the uh, raised surfaces, like the edges, are going to be lighter than the cavities, which are going to be darker. Uh, that's what gives it this nice uh, blizzard look, I could say. Well, it's not unique to blizzard, but it gives it a very nice look and it makes the texture pop. So what you usually want to do is use some of your maps that you baked. So in this case, it's usually curvature. Um, here, so you you plug in your curvature as a, a mask, a fill mask, and then you just play with the levels to get what you want. After that, I added um, some more details in the color, like very slight details, stains and, uh, well, more stains. It's just to, to, like I said, break up the monotony of just a flat surface. Some, some stylist art uh, just use flat colors. The quickest example that comes to mind is uh, Team Fortress 2. So it always depends on what kind of style you're aiming for. But if you look at Overwatch, there's usually more than just a flat color. You'll have stains, you'll have uh, edge damage and other things like that. So speaking of damage, uh, this is where I added a little bit of it, just very tiny dots. Um, the, the big thing you have to remember is most of the details that I add are hand painted with um, brushes that are just uh, directly in the program. This is because while generators can be good for saving time, the problem with them is uh, most people that, that have used the program for a while are going to recognize the generators and it kinds of... It, it's not that it necessarily gives a, a terrible result, but people are just gonna see, oh, okay, like that's this type of generator or, or smart material. And the other problem is that sometimes it just affects part of the mesh that shouldn't be affected. Like for example, you're using an edgeware uh, material or generator you might get some edge damage where it shouldn't really be there. So if you use a generator, try and then mask some some of it where it doesn't make sense. So this is the basic letter material that I made. Um, like I said, I didn't want to add too much to it. And then the next part was the gold work. So what I really wanted to have was a very different material both in terms of uh, specular and uh, color contrast so that it, it, like I mentioned before, it makes it more interesting when you're looking at your character. So in this case, once again, I did all of the uh, 
uh, fixes for the masks. And then it's basically the same thing. I put the base color in. The big difference here is that I tinted the specular. That's actually the reason, the main reason why I used uh, specular because it was way easier for me to create a uh, stylus gold material. So the only other thing I added was um, just uh, removing some gloss, some shine, as you can see, like when I pass the light here. You can see the um, like where I painted. I just used like a, a brush, and then I just like gave quick strokes to just break up the the way the specular and the gloss reacts. The face is pretty much the same thing as um, what what I just showed with the coat. One quick thing to mention is when I was talking about the texture sets. Like I said, one thing that's nice is you can isolate or hide uh, you hide them so in this case like for example we don't really care about the transitional shader or the cornea all right so the same as the code the base color with the base info for spec and glossiness so right now as you're noticing she looks really dead so one of the first things I do is add color back in her face by using um, tones so red is where you'll usually have more um, blood vessels closer to the skin so your cheeks your nose uh, close to your eyes and once again uh, using uh, blending modes so in this case overlay uh, then yellow tones yellow tones is usually where you'll have bone that's really close to the skin so the bridge of your nose well in, in the case of your uh, the bridge of your nose it's uh, cartilage but yeah. um, so your forehead um, closer here to your on your cheeks then purple tones are usually where you have colder areas on the skin so let's say hair follicles uh, especially men it would be uh, where you have your beard also, uh, underneath the eyes tend to be bluish. And then I added a few more tones, orange and pink, just to give it a bit more life. Then, this is just um, a quick mouth interior. I knew she wouldn't have um, an open mouth, so it didn't really matter too much. And then, the way um, your skin is made, light is not going to reflect the same everywhere there's spots on your skin where it's wetter wetter so uh in this case i added a stronger speck near the cheeks the nose and a bit on the forehead and then i believe in this case i removed uh some in the nostrils so they wouldn't pop out as much and a base color as well as base uh, gloss for the lips and then um, I didn't want to add too many imperfections to the skin because this is stylized and usually there's not too much info on the skin so in this case I really like freckles it could be a mole or maybe some uh, old scars but usually uh, when I do Stylized, I don't like adding too much info, so I don't want to have like a huge normal map for the pores and everything. I actually didn't use any normal map for pores in this case. And then um, the next two layers are just playing with the spec and gloss again, so just to make it less even, because right now if you look, it's pretty much just like almost just one flat color. So then, actually here, my bad. So I added a, I believe that's a, it's black and white, so just to break up a bit uh, the spec, same here, a little bit stronger. Then uh, the next two layers were just to give a little bit more color again, because she still looks kind of dead. So the first one is just uh, a colored version of the ambient occlusion, and you, you just want to make sure you don't... Uh, Put it too high because you don't want her to look like she's sunburned or just like 
orange. The next layer is to fake um, SSS uh, subsurface scattering. So it's it's not very apparent. It's just enough to just like give it a little bit more color. So this is pretty much uh, everything for just like the base skin. Then makeup. She didn't have a lot of makeup, so there's nothing really amazing. I just I just added um, a bit of eyeshadow near the eyes to make them pop a bit more, and um, just like a black line along. So eyeliner I believe it's called then brows are just um, your regular like flat color there's I believe I yeah I added um, a, a darker color because I wanted them to pop a bit more but nothing too crazy because they're not the main focus of the face so you just want them to have like color and uh, gloss info eye socket um, and the lashes, I didn't actually do them in substance, but it didn't really matter. It's just a flat black color. So. This is pretty much it for the face. The one thing that you can add to help, this is something I added uh, near the end, is a layer that's a combination of your ambient occlusion, your curvature, and the green channel from your world normal map that you just play with them, you, you play with them like uh, with the blend mode so you could put one at like multiply 50% just try to get something neat to then put over the, the character and just have a bit more light info this is something that's uh, unique to stylized art if you were making uh, realistic art you wouldn't want light info pre-baked in your character so once again uh, be careful with this layer in this case I actually removed it from the face because it wasn't very nice like it gave really ugly harsh shadows but uh, everywhere else it helped a little bit with like making some of the texture pops but nothing too crazy one more thing when you make your sculpture in ZBrush don't be afraid to not make all of the details in ZBrush. What I mean is all of the damage that's that I made here was done in Substance Painter for one big reason and it's it's easier to modify them on the spot than go back to ZBrush, modify them and rebake. Because let's say um, I didn't like any of the scratches, I'm like oh they're too big or they're too small. I'd had to go bo to go back in ZBrush and like I said redo the whole process while in painter i can just decide to just like hide it or uh, just paint over it again so choose your battles wisely look at what you feel might uh, just be easier to do later on in painter when you're done texturing sculpting baking everything the last step is to present your character so you don't want to just present your character in a T or A pose because that's just boring and it won't uh, it won't show all of the hard work you've done. So you have to pose your character and not just like give it any pose. Try and have a pose that fits the character and is interesting to look at. So just like when uh, you were sculpting, make sure to have a nice silhouette. I pose my characters in ZBrush by importing the low poly and then just masking the parts out and using the gizmo to move them. It's not necessarily the best way but it's a quick way and I find that it suits my needs. So lighting is really important. If you have a really good model with really nice textures but a bad lighting setup it's unfortunately gonna make your model just look terrible while you may have um, like on, on the contrary you could have a very average model but a very good lighting setup and just make it look really really good for lighting you'll have to start with which HDR you want there's a bunch of them and in this case, I didn't put
put it really high. It was just to uh, make it so that the model isn't completely dark. And one neat thing with um, Marmoset is that you can add fill light just by clicking on the uh, image and just play with it. In this case I didn't use any, but it's nice to know the option is there. So once you're done choosing your skylight, it's time to add the actual lights. In this case, I you I started with uh, the rim light to uh, separate the character from the background. It's very important because you don't want the whole image to look flat. And when you're doing your lighting, it's really important to turn off all turn off all of the lights that you're not working on so that you don't have anything um, you don't have any conflicting information so for example this rim light here and adjust everything until you're happy and then next light and then so on and so on so I won't go into every single detail of how I lit the character but what to keep in, what you need to keep in mind is you have to try, if you can, try and tell the story with your lighting, so that it's not just like um, a spotlight that's just like right in your character's face. Here's a good example of what I mean when I say try and um, have elements standing standing out from one another. So if you look at the hand here, it kind of gets lost uh, in this middle part, but just with this small tiny light it pops from the rest of her torso so it, it, it's not it's a kind of a case-by-case -case scenario for lighting there's not like one recipe for everything like people are often gonna mention the uh, three-point lighting with a key light then a rim light and a fill light it work it, it's good for a um, basic setup but then you're gonna have to tweak, tweak, uh, tweak it around if you want something very nice. When you're lighting your, your character, make sure to know which parts of the character are your points of interest. So usually it's going to be the face and maybe if they have like a very fancy weapon or anything. But it's very rarely going to be the legs and um, the, uh, like this part here mainly and like the feet. So when you're lighting, make sure that you don't put anything that's too crazy over here because you don't want your viewer to go straight for the feet unless that's the uh, the whole design of your character where the feet are the most interesting part. But like I said, usually it's going to be the face. So you don't want everything uh, flatly lit. Like I said, you want stuff that pops out and stuff that's a bit more in the shadow. Like you want a nice contrast. When you're creating your images for your presentation, make sure that you keep a uniform scale between all of the pictures. What I mean is, let's say this was one image, and then this, the second image. It's it's not very uh, visually appealing to have like such different width and image size. So make sure that it's uniform. So let's say this was the size for this image, and make sure all of the other ones follow so that it makes a nice continuous line. So that's it for this video. I hope you learned uh, you learned something and thanks for watching.